Good morning, everyone, both here and abroad. I would like to start uh, thanking uh, Antonio for inviting me to give this lecture today. It's always a great pleasure to be back in Trieste after spending four, he four years here uh, during my PhD. And I am very, very glad to, uh, to be here to tell you something about the connection that exists between... Sorry. Okay. Uh, the connection that uh, that exists between the very broad field uh, broad field of machine learning and uh, multi skin modeling and uh, soft and biological matter modeling, um, the the objective of this lecture is to provide an overview of uh, some of the applications that machine learning techniques, uh, in particular deep learning, but not only that, uh, have been uh, attempted and carried out in this context, in the context of, uh, of soft matter modeling. Uh, let me start uh, these lectures, okay, it's not working, acknowledging the, um, the group with which uh, I have been carrying out uh, the work that I will present during the final part of the lecture. So uh, most of the things you will see uh, until uh, the end is work of uh, other people. And at the end, I will give you a hint of the kind of work that we carry out in this context. And these are the people behind, behind that work. So the outline of the lecture is then, uh, is then this. I will start telling you something about the, the background, providing some background about the, um, uh, and, and context of the work uh, that we carry out and what machine learning has to do with that. And then we will delve deeper into, uh, into this topic. And finally, as I mentioned, I, uh, I will give you an idea of, a spe of specific applications of uh, machine learning, broadly spoken, uh, in, uh, in this context as we, as we carry it out. Um, so let's start with this, uh, this invitation in the context of uh, soft and biological matter modeling. Um, may I ask you how many of you know uh, what proteins are and what, how proteins work, just to have an idea of the, okay. A few hands. Okay, uh, I will. Uh, I do not want to go too deep into uh, into this, but uh, since I will be mainly talking about proteins because this is uh, or molecules in general, and this is the uh, the main uh, field of application of what I will be discussing. Just to give you a very brief idea, proteins are polymers, are heteropolymers of biological origin, and they are constituted by uh, repeating units. These repeating units are the amino acids and uh, they come in 20 types. These 20 types of amino acids combine, are combined by molecular machines in the cells in chains that um, collapse onto, each other, uh, onto themselves. They form, they typically, not always, but they typically uh, collapse onto themselves to form globular proteins. And these globular proteins are structured objects that carry out uh, structural and functional uh, work in the cell. The, uh, the amino acids interact with each other uh, in, a, in a manner that depends on their specific chemical properties and their sequence. And depending on which amino acids are placed in a particular sequence, uh, you get specific structures at various levels of the architecture. So for example, you see from this, uh, from this cartoon that the amino acid chain is uh, arranged locally in structures that are called uh, secondary structure. The primary structure is the primary sequence, actually. So the, which amino acids you put in sequence. And then depending on this particular sequence, you can have um, a, a winding of the chain that forms helices, the alpha helices, or a, a flatter structure that is the beta strand. And if you have many beta strands, you get beta sheets. And these structures are the fundamental building blocks of proteins that can uh, arrange themselves in complicated, very complicated structures that can be single or multiple chains. And these objects eventually uh, perform a lot of work in the cell. They can catalyze react chemical reaction. They form structural elements. Uh, they shuffle material back and forth. They do a huge amount of things. And because of that, it is particularly important to, uh, to study them. Uh, also, because from a pharmaceutical point of view, just to mention one thing, you have that uh, uh, proteins are typically the target of, uh, of pharmaceutical molecules that try to hamper or enhance the, uh, the, the biological function of proteins, because, of course, this impacts uh, diseases. So when we study proteins, 
and for that matter, any kind of uh, biological molecule, and even not biological molecules, non molecules of non-biological origin, um, we can either do that experimentally, and this is, of course, the starting point of all kinds of studies, but then we can also tackle the problem from the computational point of view. In order to do that, we need to know what the system looks like, so we have to have an idea of uh, its composition and structure, and experimentally we can uh, derive this information that tells us how at which atoms constitute the system and how these atoms are arranged, and this provides us with uh, with the, uh, if you want, a sort of cartography of the system. We know where is what. Once we know uh, this information, we can provide, uh, we can dress this structure uh, with, uh, with interactions. We can provide, uh, at the classical level, of course, we can provide uh, this model with, uh, within, in, with an interaction force field that can be employed in molecular dynamic simulations. That is, we can use the uh, structure of the system and the interactions that the components, the constituents are subject to in order to, to integrate numerically Newton's equations of motion and obtain uh, trajectories that uh, show us how the system moves and does things. Once we have this simulation, once we have the trajectory that comes out of this, uh, of this numerical approach, we hope to infer uh, properties of the system that can be subsequently employed for, uh, for, for example, pharmaceutical applications. Of course, this is just one of the, of the examples that is very specific to proteins. But for example, if we are talking about uh, polymeric materials, we want to uh, study the mechanical properties of these materials in order to devise better plastics with specific uh, properties as a function of the stress of uh, temperature and whatever kind of uh, external forcing the material can be subject to. In the biological context, then, it is uh, of paramount importance to, uh, to perform a numerical sampling of the, uh, 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 of the conformations of the system by means of numerical simulations. Of course, these systems are composed by a large number of atoms. Uh, each amino acid has, on average, 20 atoms. Uh, then you have to multiply this by the number of amino acids that you find in a protein, and this means something that goes from the super small proteins, like 30 amino acids, to the typical proteins of two, three hundred amino acids up to the thousands. And of course, this requires also the solvent to be simulated. That is water, proteins live in water with other co-solutes. Simulating these objects uh, requires a large computational uh, effort. So it is computationally demanding. At the current stage, we can perform simulations of fairly large systems. That is, for example, uh, entire viruses composed uh, putting together the virus itself and the solvent by something in the order of the million of atoms, uh, we can tackle systems that are even larger, that is, for example, uh, cellule-like cellule systems composed by membranes with proteins on top of that and other molecules uh, inside. Of course, we cannot perform a brute force molecular dynamic simulation for these systems, but with the help of some modeling, it is possible to uh, infer uh, properties of, the, of systems of that size involving billions, several billions of atoms, or uh, we can focus on smaller systems but studying them for longer times. And there are specific machines that have been devised specifically for the purpose of performing molecular dynamic simulations that can uh, that can tackle the problem from the point of view of the simulation length, because of course we can. It is not enough to simulate these systems for a few nanoseconds. But uh, in order to understand something of the biology of these systems, we have to go to at least the hundreds of nanoseconds. And the larger the system, the more difficult this is, of course. So typically, what we do is to perform large simulations on, uh, on clusters of computers, of CPUs or GPUs that are gaining uh, importance to, uh, to, to study the systems. Or, as I mentioned, there are specific computers, like the Anton computer developed by, uh, by a company based in New York, uh, that is specifically tailored for this kind of work. And, uh, and of course, this is the, the tip of the iceberg of the kind of research that is done. This is uh, a kind of, uh, kind of work that can be carried out by a very few people in the world. There is just a few Antons in the same place uh, worldwide. But typically, uh, researchers can uh, have access to computational resources that are large enough to perform important molecular dynamic simulations. And the larger 
Uh, and the more time passes, the more accessible these computers are, the more uh, effective the softwares are. So we can produce a huge amount of data. But we do nothing with data if we cannot, in some, in some sense, filter them, distill them in order to get information out of the data. So I think it is uh, after two weeks of this, uh, of this school, it is uh, absolutely evident that data per se are not enough. We need to rationalize them. We have to extract meaning out of those data. And this goes for the results of molecular dynamic simulations as well, of course. So uh, in the specific context of multi-scale modeling and the applications of this uh, broad field to, uh, to biological mole molecules in particular, we need to extract information from data that entail a certain level of complication. This, uh, let's say, this statement is based on the idea that we have complex systems and complicated systems. Typically, we have a mixture of the two properties, and complex and complicated are not synonymous. We have complicated systems that can be simplified. Complex systems are con constituted by, in principle, simple elements that interact in such a way that gives rise to an emergent behavior. And this emergent behavior cannot be uh, trivially predicted by the properties of the constituents themselves. So we need to, uh, to study the system as a whole in order to extract uh, the important complex uh, information about the complex behavior of the system. But we would like to do that, minimizing the amount of complication that the system has. That is, we want to, um, to simplify as much as possible. And this is the goal of, uh, of an important branch of, uh, of modeling that is coarse graining. Coarse graining applied in this context means to, uh, to provide a description of the system that is uh, simpler so as to figure out better what the, uh, what the system does without losing important information. This can be interpreted in two ways. We can either uh, observe a very detailed uh, uh, description of the system as it comes from a non-Latum molecular dynamic simulation, and we look at it in simplified terms so as to, uh, to understand it better. So there is a filtering procedure or there is the, uh, uh, or we can directly model the system in simpler terms. So instead of describing each single atom that constitutes the protein, we can group atoms together and describe uh, the system in terms of fundamental units that are, uh, that are atom-like balls that represent a large number, uh, a few atoms at least. And, uh, and we can simulate that system, that system directly. So we have a simplification of the structure at the very beginning, and this provides us with a simple, simpler model to simulate, and this means also a cheaper model to simulate, and we can go much faster in that direction. So we can study larger systems for longer times. The typical procedure for coarse graining starts with the knowledge of the system at a higher resolution, then a representation of the structure of the system in simpler terms, that is the mapping procedure that takes the structure of the system from a large, a highly dimensional configurational space to a smaller, still large, but smaller dimensional uh, uh, configurational space. So we have a simplification of the structure. And once we have these few fundamental units uh, that the system can, in terms of which the system can be described, we have to parameterize the interaction, interactions. We might know very well uh, how atoms talk to each other, how atoms interact, but we do not necessarily know how these effective interaction centers interact with each other. And we have to find a way of dressing those, uh, those interaction centers with, interact with uh, interactions. We have to parameterize the system. And at the end of this procedure, we have a cost grant model. To perform these operations, there are, of course, uh, several manners. There is a, a zoology of possible ways of carrying out this procedure. Typically, we have top-down strategies, knowledge-based strategies, and bottom-up or systematic strategies. The top-down top approach assumes that you already know uh, something about the emergent behavior of the system, and you employ this information in order to tweak the uh, interactions at the system at the fundamental level. That is, for example, you know what the structure of a protein is without knowing how it got there, and you construct interactions, putting springs between uh, atoms or effective interaction centers of the protein so as to have a certain structure. 
this is a no, uh, this is a top down approach because you know the structure already. You are not waiting for the protein to collapse into the structure. But you can study important properties of the system and how it fluctuates about the native structure that is the biologically functional structure. Or you can parameterize the interactions so that atoms that will be close to each other in the native structure will attract with each other, while the other ones won't. They simply uh, bounce on top of each other. This is a, a, a top-down model because you are parameterizing fundamental interactions so as to observe a specific uh, uh, emergent behavior that you know, which is not what you would do uh, from a fundamental point of view because you have to parameterize the interactions first and then see what happens. This will be the correct, uh, uh, this is what the system does. What you do is to put the, the, the answer into the question. The knowledge-based approach is very similar in spirit to what you have in a top-down approach, but you use uh, you use a large number of uh, a large amount of information to parameterize the interactions. So, in a sense, this is probably closer to what you do in in the broad sense of machine learning. That is, you provide uh, a statistical bias for the interactions. You parameterize the interactions so as uh, to reproduce uh, not really the whole emergent behavior, but, for example, correlations within. Uh, within the structure of the system. And then we get to the strategy that is closer to the physics approach, that is the bottom-up strategy, in which you have a reference high-resolution system, and you want to simplify that so as to incorporate as much information as possible in a rigorous manner and produce a simplified representation that is aware of what goes on at a more fundamental level. And of course, there is a large number of ways in which this can be done, but there is essentially one kind of objective that all possible methods have. What we, uh, what we do can be framed for a, uh, in a very formal manner as it as follows. Let's assume that our high resolution system has a certain Hamiltonian with uh, its own degrees of freedom and interactions between the degrees of freedom. And this is our fundamental representation. Then we have, a mapping that simplifies the structure. So for example, a group of atoms that belongs to a certain amino acid is mapped onto its center of mass. And everything that is left of that group of atoms is just the position of the center of mass. And then you want to provide interactions between those degrees of freedom in a way that is very close to what you started from. Those of you who are familiar with the concept of uh, renormalization group might recognize something very uh, akin to that in spirit. It is something like that. You have a high resolution system, you map it in uh, on a lower resolution system that can be structurally uh, written, that can be formal, formally written in terms of a Hamiltonian, similarly to what you started from. The, the whole issue is to find how to uh, parameterize the, Hamil the new Hamiltonian so that it does what the old system did. But of course, you have fewer degrees of freedom. You had a loss of information in this procedure. So in order to carry out this procedure formally, what you, uh, what you have to do is to figure out a probability distribution in terms of the new uh, coordinates, the fewer new coordinates, that is essentially a marginal of the old probability distribution with a constraint that the, uh, that the degrees of freedom that you, that you are interested in uh, are fixed. So you can marginalize over all the uh, high resolution degrees of freedom, fixing the configuration of the new degrees of freedom. If you do that, I'm focusing on the coordinates, you can do that also on the momenta, but this is not as interesting as for the coordinates. You get to consistency conditions that tell you that for the new model, for the Cosgrain model to be effective, to be sound, the probability distribution that you have from the coarse grain representation has to be identical to the probability distribution that you have from the high resolution model, if you look at it only in terms of the coarse grain coordinates. So here you have a probability that only depends on those coordinates and there is no chance that it can do uh, anything else. And here you have a probability distribution that is a marginal over a larger number of coordinates, retaining only the ones you are interested in. Now, the issue of course is how to do that because this is very simple to write, but very difficult to get. If you uh, carry out the integration, what you find is that the effective potential 
that, uh, that exactly satisfies this condition is essentially a free energy that is minus one over beta, the logarithm of the partition function of the old system integrated over uh, all degrees of freedom with a constraint that you get specific coordinates uh, in terms of the coarse grain variables. So if you had this potential, you would be done. All the problems that you have would be solved. But of course, this is a very complicated operation to carry out. So uh, a large number of methods have been developed to approximately parameterize interactions that tend to this kind of potential. Not focusing on them, but focusing on the field of machine learning, one can wonder whether this complicated operation can be carried out with the help of uh, the large machinery, the, the diverse machinery that has been figured out in the context of machine learning. And of course, this, uh, this question has a positive answer. And recently, or not so recently, depending on how you measure time, uh, several approaches have been uh, imp implemented and employed to perform this operation uh, that is otherwise a very complicated uh, inverse problem in which we want to tweak the interactions so as to get uh, a force field that or a pot effective potential energy that gets as close as possible to the uh, to the multi-body potential of mean force as that quantity there is called. So let's get into the uh, into the heart of the matter. How can we use machine learning in this context to carry out this uh, this uh, task? Of course, given uh, the the variety of problems that we have, uh, the first thing that you have to uh, first question that you have to uh, ask yourself is what machine learning? Machine learning, as you know much better than me, is a very broad umbrella uh, term that encompasses. These and many other techniques that go from the very simple linear regression to whatever uh, as complicated as it gets. And of course, specific uh, methodologies are appropriate for specific tasks. You have no, uh, no method that is one size fits all. You have no uh, Swiss knife in this context or in general, uh, as is the case. And uh, you have to find what is the appropriate tool that you have to employ in order to tackle your specific problem. In general, in the context of soft and biological matter modeling, we can use machine learning, the whole of machine learning for several tasks, specifically the, the vast majority of which fall into this kind of big chunks of problems. That is evaluation of quantities. You want to figure out properties of your system in quantitative terms, and you can use machine learning for that. You want to classify that might be seen as, in a sense as a very coarse uh, um, subset of the evaluation of quantity. You want to see whether your system has a certain structure or another. Uh, you want to analyze the, uh, the data that you have. As I, as I mentioned, you can perform a very large molecular dynamic simulation. You have lots of data, and then you have to dig into them to find some sense out of those data. And machine learning can help in this kind of procedure. And of course, the, uh, the complementary strategy that is to generate new structures, that is, I can use machine learning in order to do faster and possibly better the same thing that molecular dynamic simulations do. That is, instead of wasting time or spending time uh, integrating Newton's equations of motion, I can have a method that in a much faster manner produces new structures. <clears throat> so an example of the first uh, category is the calculation of energies. If we tackle the problem of, uh, of computing the energies of, uh, of molecules at the very fundamental level, we have to go into the quantum mechanical regime. So for example, here you see an example of a, uh, of a molecule that has uh, its own glory in the context of condensed matter systems that is fullerene. It's just carbon put together in the shape of a ball. But of course, if you want to calculate its properties, to compute its properties at the most accurate level possible, you have to solve Schrodinger's equation, not Newton, Newton's equations. And to do that, you have to carry out very complicated and time-consuming and resource-consuming calculations. To this end, uh, you can think of employing machine learning to do exactly the bottleneck of the calculation, that is the calculation of the energy, determining the energy based on the structure of the system. And you can train uh, um, uh, a deep neural network, as it was done, in order to to uh, produce the value of the energy based on the configuration of the system. 
These can be subsequently employed in a molecular dynamic simulation in which the forces that act on the atoms are determined through the network and not through the solution of Schrodinger's equation. And this speeds up the calculation immensely. And this allows you to, uh, to perform simulations of molecules that are full of or much more complicated stuff than that. In particular, molecules that can be of uh, technological or pharmaceutical uh, relevance. In order to do that, of course, you have to feed the network with some kind of information. And the, the more physically sound is the information you provide the network with, the better it is for the network. Uh, I think that uh, Professor Tomasetti mentioned uh, a couple of days ago that uh, you, have to, uh, you have to provide the machine learning methods with uh, refined data in order, to, in order to get a better procedure, get a better result of the procedure, better classification, better extraction of features, and so on and so forth. Of course, if you provide the network with features that are physically sound and already have some uh, information about the relevant properties of the system, you simplify a lot the job that the network has to carry out. You could provide some way, in some way, the configuration of the system, the position of the atoms, and that's it. And you let the network do the job. It's a way of doing it. But if you provide information that is based on the property, structural properties of the atoms, like, for example, how many atoms a given atom has in its surrounding, and uh, how these atoms are distributed, what is the angular uh, uh, distribution of the core uh, of, of pairs of atoms about a central one, and so on and so forth. This kind of features already have a lot <coughs> sorry, of information within themselves and a lot of physics about the system. If you do that, that is, you provide the network with features that are based on structural correlations within. Uh, within the system, you can get information that is much more accurate. And then you can, you can employ this strategy also for systems <coughs> that are larger, that are more classical, let's say, in order to characterize the structure. Uh, typically, people think that water is either a gas, a liquid, or a, uh, a solid, that is ice. But ice is, an, uh, is a horribly complicated thing. There are several phases of ice. And it might be very important to discriminate between the different phases of ice, not to mention the different phases of the liquid, different forms of the liquid phase that can be tricky as well. So what you can do is to, um, uh, is to employ these local uh, uh, functions, these uh, symmetry functions, as they are called, to discriminate between specific local arrangements of water molecules that distinguish between different phases of the um, uh, of the system at a very local uh, uh, level. So here, for example, you see a distribution of points in a plane where you have two very general descriptors of the local, uh, local arrangement of water molecules, the Q4 and Q6 parameters, that tell you essentially how tetrahedral and how hexagonal the local arrangement of the molecules is. And you see that in terms of these parameters, you have several, several spots, many of which overlap which tells you that you have different phases of the system that can be uh, associated to the different clusters, but it's very difficult to discriminate just based on them because you have regions where the different phases overlap in terms of these few, uh, these, uh, only these two parameters. So you can train a neural network based on symmetry functions. Yes, question. Okay. Uh, I have a question in previous two slides. Okay. I no oh, sorry. Okay. Going forward. Like here. Yeah, yeah, it's yes, this. So I'm wondering, are you input all the, all kinds of feature into the neural network at the same time or uh yes. Uh so if the uh, because you mentioned uh mm, we input more feature into the neural network, we can get more good results. Mm -hmm. But for different kinds of feature, they will have different kinds of, uh, how to say, uh, structure of the data. So I'm wondering you input all, all the time, uh, all of them at the same time, or I don't, I, yes. Yeah, yeah, so, so generally the uh, different features are computed simultaneously on the same structure uh, or set of structures. 
and you feed, uh, you feed the network with all of them at the same time. In this particular case, what you do is to compute for each atom several features that are, uh, for example, functions that, that account how many atoms you have in the neighborhood, uh, how many triplets of atoms you have in the neighborhood, and how the angles between them are distributed, and so on and so forth. And then you feed the network with all these informations at the same time. You do that for all the atoms, and then you uh, join this information. You extract a sort of local energy for each atom. You sum these local energies, and you get the total energy of the whole system. But all these features are passed to the network at the same time. And the network is trained, keeping this, uh, uh, reading this information simultaneously. Did I answer your question? Okay. So the um, uh, yeah, if you apply this kind of uh, strategy to a system like water, uh, and you uh, and you do that for different temperatures, you see the uh, you observe the formation of uh, ice seeds. You have the growth of the uh, of the crystals, and you can monitor how the uh, this freezing process proceeds and. Uh, in terms of the of the local structure of water, and this allows you to discriminate the free energetic contribution of different phases to the uh, to the whole system, and because of that, you can get much more accurate results uh, than um, to the uh, to estimate the free energy barrier for the for the nucleation process than what you would have assuming that the system is in just one of two phases. Uh, and without without discriminating the different phases. In order to do that, you have to discriminate the phases because each of them has a different free energetic contribution, and the network allows you to classify the different structures uh, locally and instantaneously just based on the structural information that you that you pass. Then, of course, uh, the uh, in order to to provide the system with features that are physically sound, you have to account. Uh, you better you'd better account for uh, symmetries that you have in the system. So, for example, if you have translational invariance, rotational invariance, or if you have a uh, relationship between atoms that do not depend on the absolute position, uh, or whatever other kind of uh, symmetry you might happen to have in the system, it makes a lot of sense to figure out features that explicitly account for them, as, for example, writing the, uh, the feature that corresponds to uh, a particular structure of your of your system in terms <clears throat> of uh, basis functions in this particular case spherical harmonics that um, can be uh, that are invariant upon a certain number of uh, of transformations and eventually the features that you pass are the coefficients that you employ to project the structure onto uh, a, a naturally invariant basis set. In this manner, you have uh, again, you have uh, carried out part of the job that, in principle, the network would have to carry out, and this allows you to uh, to obtain more accurate results in, for example, the calculation of the energy uh, uh, of the of a molecule based on its structure, because you are uh, you are passing better, higher quality information uh, about the structure to the to the network. This. Kind of examples refer to uh, how you can analyze the system in terms uh, by means of uh, a deep, deep learning approach. But as I mentioned, you can also generate structure. You can use these methods to generate structure. You can train, for example, a network based on a set of structures that you know that are uh, physically meaningful to discriminate between those structures that make sense from that particular point of view and those structures that don't. So, for example, if you have uh, if you have a network trained so as to distinguish between configurations of a polymer that are uh, realistically representative of a protein and those configurations that are not, you have, in, in let's say, uh, what you have obtained is a classifier that tells you what is the probability, what is the likelihood that a certain structure is a protein or it is not. But then you can use this as a method to generate new structures in that you uh, carry out a sampling procedure that moves the, uh, the, the structure around, that deforms the structure. So for example, you perform a Monte Carlo uh, simulation in which, uh, in, in which you deform the structure, and then you, you, you employ uh, the, uh, the result 
that you get from the analysis based on the neural network to determine whether this uh, structure, the structure that you got is a realistic structure for a protein or not. And this allows you to, uh, to produce structures that are consistently realistic from the point of view uh, of, the, uh, of the set of uh, configurations that the network has been trained with. And it can be shown that you can generate uh, structures that are consistent with what you would see in a molecular dynamic simulation of a protein, uh, training a network that is uh, that takes as input uh, a set of distances between the different uh, the different points. And in this particular in this particular neural network, what you do is to measure the uh, is to measure local properties of a subset of the atoms in a, in a, in a short stretch and short strand of the uh, of the polymer and then you move uh, this window th uh, along the structure and you uh, do a sort of um, um, sort of padding so you have a sort of it's not a convolutional network because it doesn't operate like that but uh, you slide along the structure to measure the uh, the local uh, the local structure the local arrangement of the polymer and to uh, and you train the network based on, on this kind of information. Of course, if you were to introduce, th this is done uh, at the coarse grained level, so you have information that uh, pertain only to the distance between the, uh, the sites that constitute the polymer. So you have a polymer that is a bead spring model. You have uh, point-like particles connected by bonds. If you were to do this on a more sophisticated structure, you could introduce also directional interaction. If you had, for example, uh, uh, side chains that can point in one direction or another. You can account for that. You can, of course, enrich the, the model as much as you want. You can enrich the information that you pass to the network. And this uh, helps in uh, discriminating better and therefore also generating better structures. <clears throat> I mentioned at the beginning that the objective of uh, modeling in the context of cross-graining is to, is to uh, devise uh, is to parameterize a, uh, an effective potential that gets as close as possible to the multi-body potential of mu force. This can be done with specific machine learning approaches, like for example the uh, the Gaussian approximation uh, approximated potentials, approximation potentials that are uh, based on uh, that, that describe the uh, effective energy, the free energy of the system in terms of a sum of Gaussians that are localized that are centered on um, configurations that have been indeed observed in the uh, in, in the training set so for example in a molecular dynamic simulation what you train the uh, the network with is the set of uh, coefficients so the the the, the prefactors of the gaussians such so as to reproduce the um, the free energy of the uh, of the system in terms of the uh, <clears throat> of the configurations that you have sampled, this is a sort of very uh, smart and effective interpolation, because as a first thing, it relies on a subset of configurations that you have sampled, and of course, what you see, uh, as it typically happens, um, uh, provides a range within which you can have configurations that are interpolated by the ones that you have observed, and the potential that you have knows what those configurations are. But then you uh, do not provide these Gaussians uh, trivially with the configuration of the um, of the system. So you do not match one configuration, the entire configuration with the instantaneous one that you have, but rather you uh, parameterize this, uh, these Gaussians in terms of uh, specific two, three, four body terms that are computed on the uh, Cosgrain sites of the system. This produces effective potentials that, that are separated in terms of the order of the interactions. <clears throat> so you have one body term that would be essentially an external field, two body terms that represent pairwise interactions, three body terms that represent three body interactions, and so on and so forth. And this is particularly useful to, uh, to gain understanding of the behavior of the system because, whether, uh, because you can discriminate whether the introduction or not of the three body terms contributes substantially in improving the uh, the quality of the result that you get. And this tells you, where, for example, whether the interactions that you have in the system are strongly directional or not, so that you have to account for the three body arrangement. Um, in this work, 
the authors have applied this method to uh, to two molecules in, uh, in, in in the liquid phase, methanol and benzene. And for example, what you can see in the case of methanol is that introducing uh, three body terms helps, maybe not dramatically, but substantially in improving the quality of the uh, of the result in terms of how well the the correlation, the three body correlations are reproduced in the <clears throat> in the system because methanol is, is not a symmetric molecule. It has asymmetries. And because of that, a, a description in which the system is just a point like particle doesn't account intrinsically at the level of structure uh, of uh, for this uh, for this asymmetry. If you put this asymmetry into the parameterization of the interactions by means of the three body term, you get a much better agreement. While, for example, in the case of benzene, you get uh, you get a, a very good result also in absence of the three body term, because you see that the level of correlation that you have within the system at the three body level is not particularly strong, it's not substantial. While in the case of methanol, it is important and in order to characterize that and to, to reproduce that qualitatively better, you have to uh, to account to <clears throat> or better you gain uh, you have a you have a gain in accuracy by including <clears throat> including a three body term so eventually uh, this is not just a matter of getting accurate potentials that carry out uh, very well the job of reproducing structures that you that you have parameterized them with it is also a matter of gaining understanding about the system because if you perform a simplification of the system and you parameterize the system in a certain manner that, manner that provides results that are qualitatively better than doing than what you get doing something else, you have acquired information about the physical properties of the system. So the advantage of using a bottom-up approach is precisely that of gaining a larger amount of understanding about the physics of the system and not just having something that works uh, nicely through a black box that I cannot make sense of. <clears throat> in particular, an example of this is given by the application of machine learning approaches with a particularly smart uh, method that is symbolic regression in understanding, for example, how reactions take place. Symbolic regression is a kind of machine learning in which you do not uh, fit parameters, but the network, the, but the machine learning approach tries to build mathematically sound functions uh, of the uh, of the input that is uh, the method proposes uh, the um, a certain a certain function with respect to another sees whether this works better or uh, or worse and eventually what produce what it produces is a function that can be read in a uh, in a human friendly manner so to speak here for example you have a very simple system that has to go from here to there a crossing a free energy barrier or an energy barrier. So you have a very simple potential that has two minima and a barrier that separates them. And the idea is to figure out not only uh, the uh, not only to observe the process of going from here to there, but also figuring out what is the most uh, sensible reaction coordinate to carrying out this process. In general, the most sensible coordinate to uh, to study a, a transition from one configuration of the system from one state of the system to another <clears throat> is the committer. The committer is uh, a function that, uh, that takes the configuration of the system as an input. And based on that, it tells you what is the probability that you go in the, uh, pro in the, in the state of the products. So let's say classifying these two states as the reactants and the products state. So what you want to have is the uh, description of the system in terms of the probability of going towards the products starting from a particular point in the configuration space. This is the optimal reaction coordinates because it tells you what is the uh, what is the path because the, let's say the the uh, uh, the path that goes orthogonally to isocommitter surfaces that is surfaces in the configuration space that have the same value for the committer. This is the most straightforward manner in which you can go from the product state to the from the uh, reactant state to the product state. So the idea is to figure out the committer by means of a uh, machine learning approach. The uh, symbolic regression method has been applied in this work to carry out this job. And uh, what the uh, 
what the method produces is a function that is this that can be read in human terms and uh, you can see that this function uh, in terms of the coordinates of the system in proximity of the path that indeed is uh, observed is uh, is followed by the system in going from from state a to state b is very close to the iso commuter lines so it is a good an excellent proxy for the commuter as a function of the coordinates and most importantly <clears throat> what the method does is to realize that there are only two possible variables that are important out of the many possible variables because you can construct a, a, an arbitrarily large number of functions of the co configuration of the system but the system realizes the, the method realizes that there are only two particular coordinates that are relevant in the description of the committer and in particular one coordinate is much more important than the other why is that the reason is that even though the system lives in a b-dimensional space, in practice, you can rotate, you can tilt the space, and you can have a straight line, a sort of straight line, a very straight line that goes from one state to the other. So the perfect um, reaction coordinate is very much one-dimensional. Of course, it is not exactly one-dimensional because the, the, the reactive path doesn't go straight through the, uh, the surface from one state to the other, but it is very close to a straight line. And this method realizes that and provides, let's say, relevances of the coordinates that are employed in the, uh, in the construction of the committer. If you apply this method to more realistic and, and interesting uh, systems, you see pretty much the same behavior. And this is very much informative because, for example, here you have the typical, the, the guinea pig of, uh, of uh, computational biophysics, that is the analine, uh, alanine dipeptide, that is a very small molecule, protein like molecule that is composed by two amino acids. And this molecule can essentially flip a couple of angles, can rotate a couple of angles. And the, <clears throat> the um, configurational space that is relevant for the characterization of the system is essentially two dimensional with a strong relevance. A stronger relevance for one of the coordinates with respect to the other. And indeed, it turns out that one particular coordinate is deemed extraordinarily important in the construction of the committer and in discriminating different configurations of the system. Then you have a few other, uh, <clears throat> a few other um, coordinates that account also for the presence of the solvent, because knowing how much solvent surrounds the molecule is important in order to characterize the state of the system, because the system doesn't live in the in, in vacuum, it is simulated in presence of the solvent, and uh, the the water molecules that surround the alanine dipeptide, in a sense, are essential part of the system itself. Then you can study uh, even more complicated reactions, like for example the association of two ions, and you realize that there are a set of uh, coordinates that are uh, more gradually less and less important, but there are a few coordinates that are important that account, for example, for the state in which the two ions are close to each other, and let's say in direct contact, or the state in which you have a water molecule that mediates the interaction between the two, and so on and so forth. And this is, let's say, more nuanced as a, uh, as a description of the system, because the system indeed is much more complicated than what we have here. <clears throat> Another interesting example of the, um, of the usage of neural networks in the analysis and construction of configurations of proteins, uh, just as a, uh, as a typical example, is the usage of, uh, of autoencoders. As uh, Richard Feynman said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And this applies very well to these kind of networks <clears throat> because these networks apparently do something very trivial. That is, they take a structure as an input and they have to learn how to reproduce exactly the same structure as an output. Apparently it's trivial, but it is not because it goes through a bottleneck and this bottleneck is essentially a coarse graining process. That is, the network has to learn to reproduce the same thing as that it has as an input in terms of very few parameters, not all the parameters that are provided as an input, but a much smaller number, like for example, two. And the importance of this procedure is that on the one hand, you can provide a, a low dimen dimensional representation 
of the system or the configurational space of the system in terms of just a few parameters. And this allows you to discriminate better classes of configurations. But once you have done that, once you have parameterized the network, you can also forget about the, um, the training part, the filtering part, uh, the funnel, if you want, that takes uh, complicated structures and funnels them into simpler representations. And you can pilot the generation of configurations based on the values that you put into these couple of uh, neurons there. Yes. Uh, in, in the middle of the hidden layer, you only have two hidden units, right? I, does yes. it possible you will lose too much information because you only have very small hidden units? Well, one of the big issues, one of the important aspects <clears throat> to uh, to tackle in this kind of approach and uh, an aspect that is extraordinarily informative is the um, is to figure out what is the smallest number of uh, of units in the bottleneck that you have to put in order to provide a realistic representation uh, of the uh, of the output with respect to the input. So if I put just one neuron, it is very hard to imagine that I can reproduce a complicated system, the, all the conformations of a complicated system. If I put too many units in the in the bottleneck, uh, maybe I can do this job perfectly, but I gain a very small amount of information because there is not an important difference between the amount of uh, neurons that I have in the in the entry layer with respect to what I have in the bottleneck. And because of that, uh, you have to, uh, the first thing that you have to do is to explore how many, what is the smallest number of neurons that you need in order to reach a certain level of accuracy. Once you have figured that out, already this is an important information because it tells you that if you have to use five neurons, five uh, hidden units in the bottleneck, and if you go below that, you won't manage to get the accuracy that you want, this tells you that the space in which the configurations of your system leave are is essentially five dimensional. Exactly. So you have to you have to make a sort of a scaling analysis uh, in which you uh, you start from a certain number that makes sense, or maybe you can start with a very small number, and if it works, you are already happy. But as it typically happens, it's not the case. This can be explained by the theoretical why you. <clears throat> You, you can do that a posteriori by, um, by trying to uh, rationalize what is the difference between the structures that you get. Going directly to, to, to the result, this is what you get by performing this kind of, uh, this kind of, kind of analysis. And uh, the way these maps are produced in the case of two-dimensional uh, hidden units, but actually you can do that also with larger numbers, is to project the points uh, so you have a set of values in each of the um, of the bottleneck units, and this is your coarse grain configuration of the of the system as the network produces it. Then you can try to find the the most accurate, low even lower dimensional representation of the system that is a two dimensional representation. If you already have two units, then it's fine, then it's easy. If you have more than two units, you can find a, a, a representation of your system in a two-dimensional space that is uh, as close as possible to the, that, that arranges points, as close as possible as they are arranged in the higher dimensional space. That is, you keep, you put points uh, so that if they are close in the five-dimensional space, they are close in the two-dimensional space. If they are far apart, they will be far apart. This allows you to, uh, to cluster structures, not in terms of the configurations, but in terms of the mapped configurations that you have in the hidden units in this low dimensional space. And you see that all the configurations that happen to have very close values of the parameters that you find in the bottleneck have very similar structures. But if you go from one cluster to the other, you can appreciate structural differences between the configurations. And you can, you can try to make sense of those configurations. Of course, this is much more complicated because you do not have an immediate correspondence uh, between the values that you get in the hidden units and the structural 
uh, arrangement of the of the system, because these are very abstract values. So what you get in the hidden units is very abstract, and you have to make an effort in assigning a meaning to what you have here. So for example, here it's relatively easy. Here I have a bunch of configurations that map onto something that I can recognize. I can call a alpha an alpha helix. So this is something that I can, that I can do because I can recognize a, an alpha helix. I have a terminology for that, and then I can. Uh, I can do this operation. Otherwise, I have to provide names for these arrangements, and a posteriori, I can say, okay, now this configuration is a, a curl of category three, whatever that means. It is very difficult to uh, to make sense of the um, of the different different arrangements. But the beauty of this strategy is that even though describing these arrangements is difficult in human terms, they can they have something in common and numerically quantitatively this strategy gives you the the quantity that they have in common the, the they it provides you the multidimensional space in which those structures have something in common that you can see because they indeed are very similar and it blurs out differences among them <clears throat> and it allows you to uh uh, to discriminate structures that have that that have differences, this might be hard uh, with standard uh, computational biophysics techniques. For example, if you compute the root mean square distance between structures, between because structures that are very different from each other in these terms might have the same root mean square distance of structures that are grouped together, but they are different from the other two. So it provides a better classification that very global uh, quantifiers of structural differences would provide. And it also provides an instrument to generate new structures because now you have a two dimensional space with, a, with certain points that you have observed in the simulation that you have used for the training of this network, but you can also place your values, you can set your parameters in a point that has not been observed before, but the network will generate the corresponding structure. And now you can perform sampling by exploring conformations, of, uh, by exploring regions of this parameter space that have not been visited, and you can create something uh, that is new. So you can actually extrapolate or better interpolate uh, between points that you have seen in regions that you have not seen. And this, of course, is much more uh, important. Yes. So, um, ah, sorry. Okay. Uh, so you you were showing uh, in the previous slide there is a, an autoencoder, and then you said you applied it together with a sketch map. Yes. So sketch map would would, and you talked about in in your example um a five-dimensional latent space and then where do you apply sketch map i did not understand is it to to go from five to to two yes okay so in order to visualize it like exactly that. so it's a it's a visualization uh procedure uh in which you so for example if you have two neurons here of course you don't need that because yep. you already have a two-dimensional space and you can see that but let's say that you <clears throat> in, in order to get a certain accuracy you have to employ five ten uh hidden units and these uh might be much small 10 units might be still much smaller than what you provide the network with but it is difficult to visualize things in a 10 dimensional space so what you want to do is to provide an even lower dimensional representation through sketch map that minimizes a quantity that uh that is the uh the distance between points in the two different spaces so that points that are, that are close to each other in the five-dimensional space will stay close to each other in the two-dimensional space. And if they are far, they will stay far. And then you will create maps that are easier to, that are easy to visualize. That, uh, and, uh, and of course, it might happen that certain features are overlapped because you are effectively projecting somehow the five or 10 dimensional or whatever dimensional space onto a two-dimensional one. But of course, from the point of view of interpretation, it's something necessary in order to uh, in order to make sense from a human point of view of the data that you get. Okay, last but not least, in the context of uh, of machine learning, 
uh, we need to uh, talk about folding because folding is uh, one of the main problems that we have in uh, protein in protein physics. That is, if I give you the sequence of the uh, uh, of the protein, can you predict the structure in which it will fold? It's a very difficult uh, problem, and uh, typically what we do is to start from the sequence to construct the system in a uh, to, to, to set up the, the protein in a molecular dynamic simulation in a non-rolled fashion. Then we let it go, we let it simulate, let the simulation go, we let the protein fold, and eventually we get the, uh, the native structure. This is the hope. Of course, it's very hard to get that, especially if you perform a molecular dynamic simulation at the all atom level, because the system is very large, but this is, can be very large, but this is not really the problem. The real problem is that you have to simulate for times that are extraordinarily long with respect to what we do typically. Uh, Anton can manage to fold relatively small proteins, but again, this is the tip of the iceberg. We want to do that if possible, if not on a desktop computer, on a relatively small cluster. This is important for, important for pharmaceutical um, reasons for figuring out uh, diseases and properties of uh, biological systems and so on and so forth. So of course, we would like to rely on machine learning in order to associate the sequence to the structure without having to carry out the molecular dynamic simulation, but just jumping the whole process and getting to the final result. Needless to say, this is essentially a black box in the sense that it is very, uh, it is essentially useless. I would say essentially because we never know, but it is essentially useless to figure out the process that takes you towards the folding up to a certain point, as we will see. But uh, but at least if you know the sequence of a new protein that has just been discovered, you can, in a fraction of a minute, get the uh, uh, a very good guess for the structure because the network, and in particular the network alpha fold, has been trained in order to associate the sequence of a protein to what? Not directly to the structure, but to the contact maps. To the contact map of the protein that, it is, that the protein is supposed to have in the native structure. This is essentially a matrix that tells you what is the probability of having two amino acids in core two atoms in, uh, in a certain proximity in the native structure. This can be used as a bias for a steered molecular dynamic simulation in which you let the protein collapse so as to minimize the distances according to the matrix that has been produced by alpha fold. And this is what you get. You start from a certain conformation and in a sort of steeper, steepest descent manner, you get pulled toward the, uh, the minimum of the deviation between the instantaneous contact map and the one that you need to have in order to, uh, uh, to be compliant with the result of alpha fold. Uh, the reason why I said that it is partially useful from, uh, or useless, it depends, for the, from the point of view of folding is that this is not a realistic folding pro process. This is just a, a brute force, steepest descent to, to force the, the chain into the structure. So this per se can provide some information but it, about the pathway, but it is very unlikely that it is realistic. A much better thing that you can do is that once you have the native structure or a very good guess for that, you can perform enhanced sampling or steer the molecular dynamic simulations that based on the knowledge of the native structure will push, uh, will help the protein to reach the native structure across uh, a pathway that is, uh, that is more realistic, that is physically sound and biologically sound. But since you know already where you want to get, you can do that in a much faster manner by means of enhanced sampling approaches. Okay, so in the last 25 minutes, I would like to uh, give you a couple of examples of the kind of work that we in our group carry out um, in, the, uh, in the analysis of, of data that come from molecular dynamic simulations um, with methods that can be ascribed to the very broad, yes, there is a question. Is it on? No, probably not. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask if the uh, dynamics of the protein folding process are specific for specific sequences, or can there be different ways to reach the same ultimate structure? Uh, you, you mean the parameters, like the parameters of the network? Uh, no, it's just uh, the process of folding mm -hmm. that 
your ah, in, let's say in, in the real thing in, in the, biology okay. yes yes well the mm, that's a tricky question that would require a tricky answer uh in general you can say that the process is the same let's say the physics is the same so uh, atoms interact always in the same manner but um the the way a protein folds into its native structure is strongly dependent on the uh, on the native structure and the pathway that it falls uh, that it follows uh, is specific to that of course you can have classes of proteins that are very similar in structure that most likely follow pathways that are very similar uh, a counter example to that is knotted proteins that is proteins that have um, a knot in them let's see if i can manage yes so uh if you have a knot in the native conformation, actually, as the as the protein that I was showing in this uh, here, so this is a knotted protein. Let me. This is a knotted protein that has uh, a backbone that forms a knot. You can have proteins that have very similar structures, but one is uh, knotted and it has a knotted backbone, and the other one is not. You would, you would think that based on the strong similarities between the native structures, the folding process might be the same, but it is it cannot be because in order to form a knot, you have to follow a very specific pathway or much, you have a much more restricted series of pathways that you can follow with respect to the case in which you do not have a knot. So this is a counterexample of that. But typically, if you do not have topological entanglements and you have structures that are similar, then it is likely that the folding pathway will be similar. Then if you have different proteins with different native structures or even different lengths, for example, the pathway can be arbitrarily different because it depends, it really depends on the specificities of the protein. So as a general thing, it is different, but of course it is driven by the same fundamental rules that is electrostatic interaction, hydrophobic interactions, and so on and so forth. So one specific sequence should follow one specific pathway if the structure is the same. Yes. Yeah. Um, the pathway can be very complicated and yeah. can be branched in different uh, pathways. So you can have different intermediate states and so on and so forth. Eventually, a given sequence holds in a given structure, asterisk, because there are, of course, exceptions like uh, intrinsically disordered proteins that do not have a single native structure, but jump from one to the other in a very simple manner. Uh, but for globular proteins with one single well-defined native structure, you have that a sequence is associated, associated to a native structure. You can have slightly different sequences with very similar native structures and so on and so forth. So okay. de depending on the sequence similarity, you can have structures that, that are close, 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 and then they are not close anymore. But it depends on how close the, se the sequences are. Okay, and the process should also depend on the solvent nature of the solvent. That the process depends a lot on the thermodynamical environment of the system in general, so temperature, for example, as well as the uh, the presence of solvents and co solutes and co-solutes, uh, the presence of other molecules. What we see in simulations is uh, the life of a protein in absolute isolation with a few ions, maybe. What happens in a cell is that the folding process is hampered or helped by the presence of a huge number of other things that crowd uh, the, the environment. And this might even be helpful for proteins to, to fold because they are uh, pushed toward, towards more compact conformations. Uh, specific proteins need help in folding, need to be shielded by the surrounding. And because of that, you have chaperones that uh, that uh, eat up the protein in a cage that is in, in a box where the protein folds and then it is uh, expelled. There is a large variety of strategies, but <clears throat> the environment definitely plays a role. So the kind of folding pathways that we observe in molecular dynamic simulations always have to be taken with a grain of salt uh, because, uh, because we know that these conditions are not realistic with respect to what happens in vivo. Maybe in vitro might be closer, but again, um, we have to be aware of the immense uh, number of limitations and approximations that our methods and our models have. Uh, and one more question is, uh, so we here we are dealing with having a sequence and from there going to the final structure, but the intermediate process, uh, I'm thinking of if we even uh, can decode it to a great degree of accuracy, what practical use can we have of that information? It, like I'm speaking of the practical applications of the 
folding process. The folding process, yeah. uh, the correct yeah. one or the one yeah. to get in? Uh... Um, say we get it to a great degree of accuracy, like in whatever if way. If we can simulate the folding yeah. process. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is uh, it is absolutely key to uh, to understand how the protein reaches the biological biologically active state, and because of that, it provides information. About, okay, from the practical point of view, I'm saying uh, one example is that you can interfere with the folding if you know the pathway, because you have intermediate states that can, that can be hampered with. You can uh, design proteins if you know how it folds. You can also uh, design a specific sequence that follows a particular pathway in order to get to a particular structure that you want. And uh, in general, the folding process is a, uh, is a brilliant example of a complex uh, system, a complex process, and an emergent property because you have interactions that are very simple to understand. We know uh, how the physics at that level works, but it is very hard to, uh, to foresee from there what will be the emergent structure that comes out of that and um, understand the better we understand the folding process the better we can uh, we can perform this bridge between the basic information that is present in the sequence and the result that we get as an emergent as a collective property of the of how the system works all together thank you okay so in the, in the last 15 minutes I will try to speed up to uh, showing a couple of things. So I will be very uh, qualitative. And of course, you are more than uh, welcome to ask questions after, maybe during lunch. So the uh, the goals that we, that as many others, we would like to, uh, to achieve uh, in this context are to figure out how uh, proteins work based on their physical properties and perform and uh, carrying out a modeling of the systems that is informed by the physical properties of the system itself. Like for example, constructing models that are coarse where the system can be represented in a coarse manner and more accurate when you need to have a certain accuracy. In order to do that, we need to, uh, we need to simplify. But simplifying is a very, complicated, uh, a very complicated procedure, it's a very complicated task because there is no straightforward recipe to simplify. What we are trying to do is actually to figure out a sufficiently straightforward and general strategy to simplify that, as I will mention, can be applied in different contexts. Um, I will start with uh, the application of a methodology that actually originated from this place, that is the framework of resolution and relevance that has been developed uh, mainly by uh, Matteo Marsili and co-workers. And uh, this method is a sort of, uh, we, we can say that, uh, hoping that Matteo doesn't get offended, as um, uh, it, it can be seen as the as a measurement of the information content of the system. This is what entropies do. That is uh, to based on a certain empirical probability distribution to figure out what is the information content within that inform that probability distribution. But here we have two probability distributions. One is the probability distribution of the configurations of the system. So if we have a certain number of configurations of the system, we label them based on some label labels S, and we group them together. We produce empirical probabilities that are essentially the uh, the relative population of each cluster labeled with a certain label, and you can compute the entropy of this description of the system. So this tells you how much detail we have in a particular description. Then we can compute the relevance. The relevance. Is, a probability, is, a, is the entropy associated to the probability distribution of the frequency of the sizes of the clusters. That is the probability that this labeling induces a clustering where you have a certain probability of clusters of a size K, where you have K instances within the, um, sorry, this is the probability of having a certain number of clusters. So this is, if you want, related to the relative number of clusters that contain K instances, K, K configurations. So this can be related to the amount of important information that you have in the system. These two things are not the same. You can modulate this thing in a continuous manner. For example, if you have a very stupid labeling that discriminates just two kinds of configurations, then you have only two states of the system, and this corresponds to having a very low resolution 
with which you depict the system. If you have a super fine, accurate labeling of your configurations, so accurate that you can actually discriminate any configuration from any other, the empirical probability that you get is one over the number of configurations you have. This is the highest level of detail with which you can describe the data set you have, but it is not informative at all. And there is a relation between these two quantities such that the relevance is actually the resolution minus a quantity that can be seen as a noise. If you perform different kinds of labeling, what you get is a plot that looks like that. You have that at the beginning, the noise is very small. At the beginning, meaning that you have um, you have the possibility of um, uh, well, well, you, you group together frames group together uh, configurations of the system in uh, uh, in very few, very large clusters. And at this level of resolution, it is very hard to have different clusters that have the same number of configurations within. And because of that, you uh, you can um, you, you have a very large relevance and very small noise. It happens, I will not go into the details, but it happens that you have a very small noise. And because of this, as you grow in resolution, the relevance does the same linearly. But at some point, noise kicks in and you start to have a deviation between the two up to the point that you have a maximum. And if you continue, you eventually drop to zero. And this makes sense because if this is the relevant information about the system, the important information, when you have a description that is as accurate as possible and you distinguish all configurations, the amount of useful information in that description is essentially zero. Same as if you have a description in which you take all the configurations and you put them all together on the same label. In between, you have a soft spot where you have a high relevance for an intermediate value of resolution. <clears throat> take the case of the simulations of a protein. You can perform this operation <clears throat> of labeling by means of a clustering of the conformations that you explore that are close to each other from a structural point of view. And you can do that changing the level of um, tolerance with which you put together configurations. You can be very easy going. You put together frames that have configurations that are pretty much similar, but don't, not that much. Or you can demand that if, you, if two, two configurations are even slightly different, they will be considered as different. So you can span an entire range and what you get for different numbers of, um, <clears throat> of atoms that you employ to cluster configurations together, you obtain a curve like this. So what you see here is actually the, uh, a proxy for the resolution in that you have a certain tolerance for grouping configurations together, but you do not use the entirety of the system. You use a variable number of specific atoms to group together the configurations based on them. Of course, if you have a very large number, it's as if you were grouping configurations based on the entirety of the structure. If you have very few atoms, if you consider very few atoms, you are grouping together configurations based on a couple of atoms. And essentially, if you have two, it's only the distance between them. And you can see that if you do this operation for various numbers of atoms and various choices of atoms at a given number of atoms that you keep, you have curves that uh, form that have this bell shaped. Uh, bell shape, uh, and of course, for a given value of resolution, you can have the different values of the relevance as well as the number of atoms because you can perform choices that are more or less informative. How to discriminate, how to figure out what is the most appropriate number of atoms to retain in order to provide a coarse grain description of the, uh, of the system? Well, uh, if you use this number, you have too many uh, atoms, of course, because you have a too detailed representation. Same as you go here, you have a too coarse description, and also in this case, it is not informative uh, as well. There is a particular point that is this, where you have the slope of the cur curve that on average is equal to minus one. This means that if you start decreasing the resolution, at each step in which you decrease the resolution, let's say you decrease the resolution by an amount one, you increase the relevance by an amount that is larger than one. If you get to this point, you have exactly the same amount of gain in relevance as you have a loss in resolution. 
So you have that up to this point, you gain more than what you lose. If you continue, you might get to higher values of the relevance, but you gain less relevance than the amount of resolution that you lose. So from the point of view of data compression, this is the optimal point, because at that point, th that is the last point where you gain more or as much as what you lose in terms of resolution. You would like to have the, the, uh, the, more com the most compact representation, so the lowest resolution, but you want to get there by gaining as much as possible information. And this is the optimal point where you can place yourself. This determines a certain number of, um, uh, of atoms with which you uh, have to describe the system at the Korsman level, but it doesn't tell you which ones you have to pick, or it might, but it is not the most appropriate measure to employ. Turns out that there is another kind of information, uh, information measure that is more adequate to figure out, given a certain number of atoms to retain in the description, uh, how to distribute them across the structure to get the most informative representation. And this measure is the um, mapping entropy. That is a kullback leibler uh, distance, a kullback leibler divergence between two probability distributions. One probability distribution is the probability of sampling a certain configuration. So if you want, it is the uh, all atom probability distribution. You measure the distance from that distribution that is your reference. So this is the one that you have uh, in the outside of the logarithm that you average over. But here you have a probability distribution that is reconstructed based on what you have at the coarse grain level. That is to say, this probability distribution is obtained by computing what is the probability that a certain high resolution configuration uh, maps on to, belongs to the cluster of configurations that are at a certain that at, uh, at the Korsman level are the ones that map uh, onto which the high resolution configuration, configuration maps. This was horrendously said, so I will try again. This function takes the high resolution configuration and provides the resulting Korsman configuration. This is the probability of sampling a given coarse grain configuration. This is the probability that a certain high resolution configuration maps onto, um, this is the probability of sampling a high resolution configuration that maps onto the coarse grain configuration that you provide as an input to this probability here. This quantity here normalizes with respect to how many configurations you have at the Korsman level, that at the Olatom level, that map onto that particular Korsman configuration there. So in a sense, what you're doing here is to flatten the uh, probability distribution at the high resolution level, assigning to all Olatom configurations that map onto the same Korsman configuration, the average probability among them trying to use the fact that the picture is worth a thousand words. This is our mapping procedure. That is out of a high resolution representation, we provide a filter. That is we retain just a subset of the atoms. Then we reconstruct our high resolution image at the Olatom level by assigning to all the pixels that we have discarded, the same probability of the one that we have retained is actually the average among a subset of configurations, but let's say that this is, this is the spirit of the idea. So you reconstruct this image and the objective of this procedure is to figure out what is the, uh, the choice of those particular pixels to retain that minimizes the distance, the discrepancy between this low resolution representation and the high resolution representation. The re this is a fairly intelligent choice you could do a horrible choice like retaining all the, uh, all the pixels at the top of the image. If you were to reconstruct the image, you would assign to all the pixels of the image, essentially a blue color, but this would have a terrible uh, distance from the reference uh, image. If you perform a more uniform selection, you can reconstruct something that is certainly not as beautiful as this, but it gives you an idea of a mountain with something dark that might be interpreted as a tree and, and the blue sky above. So this is 
uh, this procedure is carried out it, it, iterating over different choices of the atoms that you retain in order to figure out that particular selection that produces um, that produces um, uh, um, a, a coarse grained representation, a coarse grained image that has the smallest deviation from the high reference one, and therefore the smallest mapping entropy. Why do we want to do that? We want to do that because in this manner we obtain coarse grained pictures, coarse grained representations of the system in terms of a few atoms, of a small number of atoms, that uh, correspond to um, that, that particular picture, knowing which you know essentially anything about the system. The reason is that this particular subset is the one that constrains optimally the structure of the rest of the system. So if you know where uh, which these atoms are and you know how their, uh, their arrangement is in space, you can essentially uh, determine anything else about the structure of the protein based on them. And it turns out that these atoms that emerge as particularly important also are those ones, or among those, you find those ones that are important from a biological point of view. So as a first thing, from a procedural point of view, you do not figure out the particular selection of atoms. You actually carry out a large number of optimizations because the, the mapping entropy landscape in the space of selections of atoms is terribly rugged. So you perform a number of simulated annealing procedures to find the local minima. And then you obtain pictures like this, where you have the probability for a given atom to belong to one of the solutions of the mapping entropy minimization protocol. So you essentially have a likelihood of, a, of an atom to be part of a configuration of minimum for the mapping entropy. And you see that the, uh, those atoms that have a high value of the mapping, and, uh, sorry, that uh, have a high value of the probability, and therefore they typically appear in a solution of the mapping entropy minimization protocol, are those that carry out an important biological function in that, for example, in this case of this protein, are the ones that uh, interact with the natural substrate of this protein. This protein is, um, uh, is poison. It's uh, the active molecule, the, uh, the active uh, protein of, um, um, of the venom of a, of a scorpion. And um, what this protein does is to clog an ion channel on the surface of the cell and prevent ions to go through the ion channel. Because of that, the cell dies. In order to do that, this protein has to interact with the surface of the ion channel, and it does so precisely through these atoms that are fairly exposed and are identified with a higher probability to belong to those configurations that minimize the mapping entropy. Now, this is remarkable because we provided in the simulation no information whatsoever about what kind of interactions this protein has to have with the substrate. We didn't have the substrate in the, <clears throat> uh, in the simulation, but it turns out that this kind of information is intrinsically present in the structure and the, in, in the energetic, energetics of the, uh, of the behavior of the system. And the mapping entropy protocol can manage to figure out this um, this procedure. Now, of course, the minimization protocol of the map. Yeah, question. How to optimize? How to optimize? Yeah. Exactly. So the, the uh, thank you because this actually goes in the direction of the next slide. The optimization is done selecting in a binary fashion a subset of the atoms to retain. So you have zeros or one. You fix the number of ones that you have, because this is the number of atoms that you want to retain, and you, uh, you shuffle around the configuration. So if you, if you have a certain selection of atoms, uh, at the next step, you propose to uh, discard a certain atom and instead keep another one. Then you... Or the space of or the mapping. This is, a, this is an optimization can you repeat the question? Yeah, I repeat the question. Um, so the, actually, if you can repeat the question because I didn't get it. Okay. <clears throat> You're optimizing over a vector of discrete vector zero one. Basically. Yes. But can you optimize over a space of functions M in general? Like you parameterize M in some way and then you optimize over. 
Well, the, <clears throat> the mappings that, you, that we employ are decimation mappings in the sense that we either retain or discard specific degrees of freedom that are already there. Typically, when you do a coarse graining, when you do coarse graining, you take a bunch of atoms and you map them onto the center of mass of the group of atoms that you lump together in a certain uh, in a certain bead. We could perform an optimization in terms of the assignment of atoms to certain groups and also modulate the coefficients of the mapping uh, onto uh, the particular cosmic site. Yes, yeah, so, say so you you go from R small R to Big R was yeah. big R with the neural network, and then you optimize all the parameters of the neural network such that you minimize mapping entropy. See what I mean? Um, on the one hand, we okay, um, before going to the mapping entropy, we could do something like that, but this would increase enormously, enormously the configurational space because we would have a continuous range of several parameters with several constraints because you have to, to keep uh, um. Geometry, geometrical properties, and this would be computationally very hard because at each step you propose a change in the mapping and you have to recompute the mapping entropy. But precisely at this point, the um, uh, machine learning kicks in and it can be employed to skip the optimization procedure and the simulation procedure so that you do not have to perform the simulation of the system to begin with, because of course, all our optimizations are based on the calculation of the mapping entropy that is done through the configurations sampled in an MD. But we can skip that and train a neural network to take as an input the whole structure. And for a given selection of the atoms that you retain, so for a given mapping that is part of the input to the neural network, uh, it provides the output uh, value of the mapping entropy so that we can perform the optimization still on the discrete uh, set of configurations of atoms, whether you retain them or not. And, um, uh, but the calculation of the mapping entropy is instantaneous with respect to what we had before. And uh, we carried out this uh, work for, for two different proteins. We trained uh, graph convolutional networks on, uh, uh, on two different systems. We found very, um, very consistent uh, data, so we get we got a very uh, good correlation between the uh, not only within the training set but also with the validation set. We have that the values of the mapping entropy that we get are very close to the ones that we expect from the optimization of the mapping entropy. And if you put together the neural network and the um, uh, and the fact that we have used to perform this calculation GPUs with respect to CPUs. Overall, we get a speed up factor of 10 to the fifth. So it is way faster. Of course, the problem that we, uh, that we have up to this point is that you have to train on a given system for the given system. So in a sense, it's not really a great example of generalization. But of course, this is just a, uh, it's a first preliminary work in a sense. And it shows that a lot can be done in the direction making use of the um, making use of deep learning in this context as well. Okay, now in the interest of time, I have to cut the uh, very last uh, topic. So I will uh, conclude here. Um, if there are more questions, I will, I'm, av I'm available for, for lunchtime. And um, getting to this point, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Raffaello. Are there any Questions uh, from the audience? Okay, anyone online? No, I don't see any uh, item in the chat. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, and uh, okay, so with that, we can conclude our morning session. We're going to have lunch break and uh, reconvene at 2 p.m. for the last lecture by Giulio Caravagna. Thank you. Thank you. No. No. Okay.